Hello and welcome. This is Unheard. We make it our mission here to try and understand what's really going on behind the mainstream narrative. And one person who should help us do that is a journalist who is based in, at the moment, Kabul in Afghanistan. She is the chief international correspondent for CNN and has been at the center in the past few days of various memes and online discussions about comments she made in Kabul. She's become a bit of a political football, so we would really like to find out what's going on. We conducted the interview a few moments ago, and I should say there is quite a few interruptions. Um, she's talking to us from her compound in Kabul, so the power comes on and off and lights come on and off, but we got a lot of fascinating uh, information from her, and thanks Huge thanks to her for taking the time to talk to us. This is Clarissa Ward. Hi, Clarissa. Hi, Freddie. So first of all, thank you for taking the time for doing this. Um, there is a lot of things that we want to hear about what you're seeing in Kabul. But first, let me just get this little culture war issue out of the way. In the last couple of days, you will have noticed um, there's been a lot of talk about a clip that you did uh, where you said, that some Taliban fighters were chanting death to America, but yet they seemed friendly. Uh, and amongst others, Senator Ted Cruz has been tweeting about it, saying that, is there no enemy of America that CNN will not support? What's your reaction to that? Well, the full clip, and, and this was the whole problem, is that the context wasn't given. The full clip was me saying, they're chanting death to America, but they're behaving in a friendly way towards us. It's utterly bizarre. That was the clip. It was a statement of fact. At the end of the day, I just think that all commentary that distracts from what's happening to the Afghan people right now, that in any way kind of minimizes or reduces or trivializes their suffering, is not something that I really want to engage mm. with or pay attention to. I'm here to tell the Afghan people's story, and I'm going to keep on doing it. And actually, the comment is an interesting one, because what you're observing there is that although they have these very hateful slogans, these are what, they're young men, they are at the moment being peaceful. What is your impression, having seen so many of those Taliban fighters on the street, of what kind of people they are? Well, I mean, it runs the gamut. I would say that most of them are not highly educated. They have been fighting since they were old enough to carry a gun. They don't know any other way of life. But the one thing that you can't deny about the Taliban is that they are coherent and cohesive and they have a clear chain of command. So when the Taliban leaders said to its fighters, you are not to you know, engage in sort of criminal-like behavior or retaliatory attacks when you go into Kabul, you're there to maintain law and order. And I would have to say, barely a shot fired and for the most part, um, it has been, well, with the exception of the incredibly horrific scenes at the airport, in the city center, it has been relatively calm. Mm -hmm. So there is a sense that the Taliban fighters, for now at least, do what their leaders to tell them to do. OK, Clarissa, we lost you momentarily there. That sounds like you had a power cut. You're back. You were telling us about the atmosphere on the streets of Kabul. And the thing sitting here in London or in the West that feels strange is that we hear about the Taliban fighters coming in from rural areas, and yet barely a shot has been fired. How do you explain that? I mean, it's definitely quite something to wrap your head around. And I don't think anybody would have ever predicted it. Kabul, a city of six million people falling to the Taliban in a matter of hours, as you said, barely a shot fired. I think, though, having spent a few weeks in the country before this all happened, I did start to get a very strong sense of just how weak the Afghan army was. I drove past a checkpoint on my way into Taliban territory, and the Taliban were taking shots at the checkpoint. And suddenly we just saw these Afghan soldiers coming down from their base, running down, hailing a civilian car down, getting... And that for me was one of those real moments where the Afghan army does not have the appetite for a fight right now. Wait, I have... I've got one more idea to for better Wi-Fi, okay? Okay. Okay. Is it still, is it light? No, it's getting dark, but we have a light up there we can use. Hey, 
to get in the floor. Yeah, well, well give the us a bit of a tour <laughs> since we're moving. Is this, yeah. a, is this a hotel? Is it a compound? What are we looking at? It's a compound. It's a, it's a compound. It's a private residence. We're now on the roof. This is where we do our live shots. The better internet. No power up there. Oh, there you, we got you back now. No, I'm here, Freddie. I, so is there a general, is yeah, there a power cut just, across the I, whole I city or? Oh, there's just power cuts like 20 times a day, but normally the generator kicks in. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm just, we're just going to do it here. Is that okay? okay? I mean, it's Afghanistan, guys, you know? Okay, so you have tried to get new Wi-Fi on the roof. There's a power cut. You're now sitting in the hall outside the roof terrace. Thank you for, for being so accommodating with us. We're trying. What we're trying to <laughs> what we're trying to understand is how it happened. And I, you mentioned there that the kind of capacity of the military was clearly less than people thought. Is there another factor, mm. which is that the Taliban had more support within parts of the population, or even within the military, is there something there that we need to understand? I wouldn't say they had support within the military. They definitely uh, enjoy a lot of support in very rural conservative areas. And, you know, we have this idea, understandably, in the West that we're sort of horrified by this draconian medieval interpretation of Sharia law, and it feels, you know, very... Uh, oppressive to us. But in a lot of Afghanistan and rural areas, issues like women's empowerment and women's education, they're, they're just not priorities. Mm. And so what the Taliban is able to bring to people that I think has been underestimated is a sense of security. Because they rule with such an iron fist, um, things tend to be pretty lawful in their areas. And you'll hear people again and again, and this is the same way they came to power, by the way, in, in the late 90s. People were so exhausted of war that they were almost just like, okay, whoever can provide security wins. Mm. And the Taliban has certainly demonstrated, especially with the US leaving and that fighting no longer being a factor, that it can provide some security in the areas that it holds. And we're seeing that on the streets here as well very chaotic scenes at the airport but in the center of the city it's it's relatively quiet there's cars back on the street the markets are open i don't want to paint a rosy picture because it definitely isn't rosy thousands of people are petrified and hunkered down and hiding out in their homes but it's not chaos and anarchy and shooting on the streets and how with the and how are those fighters being received on the streets of kabul where it's the metropolitan capital you would expect them to be most unpopular there are people hiding from them throwing things at them smiling at them what are you seeing it's a mixture i would say many people are hiding they're too afraid to leave their homes i can't tell you how many people i've interviewed over the last few days who literally cannot leave the house they're so scared I interviewed a young man on the street on day one of the islamic emirate of afghanistan and he was in a state of shock, I think. He said, we just kept repeating, we lost everything, we lost everything. And I was like, why don't you go home? You shouldn't be sort of saying this loudly in front of the Taliban, but honestly, I think he was just in a complete state of shock. But we did also see, Freddie, young people going up and posing for photographs and taking selfies with the Taliban and shaking their hands. And was that young, um, did you observe generally younger people, like people who don't have memory of the previous Taliban? that were doing that? Yeah. The people that I saw doing that tended to be younger, absolutely. And they don't have a memory of the Taliban as governors, but they do have the experience of two decades of a brutal insurgency. I will say the thing that has surprised me the most is the bravery of many Afghans in speaking out to the Taliban. So uh, Zabiullah Mujahid, who is the Taliban spokesperson, gave his first press conference last night and he was talking about the blanket amnesty that was being offered to everyone by the Taliban. And this journalist stood up and said, okay, you're offering forgiveness, but do we forgive you? Are we expected to forgive you for the car bombs and the civilian casualties? 
And Mujahid answered something to the effect of, oh, collateral damage happens in war. But I could not believe it watching that, the courage mm. of that journalist. And then another woman stood up and said, what about women's rights? And another one stood up and said, what about female journalists? And we've seen a few protests even. I should add though, this will probably be short lived because there was a protest today in Jalalabad outside of Kabul and the protesters took down a Taliban flag, put up an Afghan flag and the Taliban opened fire on the crowd and chased them away. So, you know, the Taliban's sort of honeymoon period, so to speak, I think it only stretches so far and it's only a matter of time. And I think we're already starting to see their true colors. Have you asked anyone about the departed administration, the president who seems to have just vanished? What sort of reputation do they have? Oh, pretty bad. I mean, and, and here's the thing. A lot of people in Kabul hate the Taliban, but boy, do they hate President Ashraf Ghani as well. The corruption of the government, the incompetence, the way that he left in the middle of the night uh, on a chopper, um, abandoning mm. his people, essentially. Not just his people as in the Afghans, but his team. I interviewed one of his private security today, and he couldn't believe it. He said Ghani's last words before getting on the plane were, I'm just going to go and do an interview. And then he left them. And now this man is in hiding with his wife and, and, and children and mm. has nowhere to go and no way to get out. So there's a huge amount of resentment and anger. And don't forget, five days before this whole thing collapsed, Ghani was still talking about building hydro dams. And there's a sense that because he was so divorced from the reality of the situation, because he never really believed that the US was going to, to actually leave, he missed so many opportunities to start conversations that needed to be started much earlier. So is he seen as a kind of distant elite kind of figure? I mean, it would sound ridiculous to make a parallel with such different countries as the UK or Europe or the US, but is there a bit of a distant parallel between kind of rural, more conservative people and what is perceived as a, a distant international elite? Do you think we can make that link? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that you could compare it to, to examples in the US or the UK, but you could definitely say, even in Kabul, that the Afghan government was riven with corruption. And there's a lot of anger about that. And there's plenty of people in this city who view Ashraf Ghani not just as weak or incompetent, but as a traitor. You've been going in and out of Afghanistan for these years. Is your impression that had the US stayed, they could have kept the peace? I mean, do you, do you leave this experience thinking that they should have stayed? Well, I mean, look, as a journalist, it's never your place to prognosticate about what should have been or would have been or could have been. Um, I, I, I will say this, I, I think that the issue most people have with what's been happening is not the US withdrawal itself. People in Afghanistan understand that the US could not keep fighting these war for another two decades, right? That there was a limit, that Afghanistan needed to defend itself. It's the manner, it's the execution, it's the catastrophic way in which the whole thing played out where the US just pulled the ripcord and people here feel that sufficient concessions were not extracted from the Taliban before these agreements were made. The US had already essentially announced its withdrawal saying that as long as you guys don't make this place ever again a safe haven for Al Qaeda, we're okay with it. That's okay. You, you know, the rest we can sort of accept. That's what the perception is that the people here have been abandoned and that there wasn't enough planning or preparation that went into averting the crisis that we've seen play out before our eyes. You've just come back earlier today from the airport. What did you see? We've seen these amazing and harrowing pictures of people clinging to airplanes and the airplanes taking off anyway. Why are there so many people in the airport? What are they expecting to happen there? So there are still, there now, there are far fewer people in the airport than there have. Oh, no. Oh, I can still hear you. Can you? Okay. Yeah. 
Um, there are far fewer people at the airport now than there were previously. Um, but there's still hundreds and hundreds all around the streets leading up to the airport. And the Taliban is controlling the checkpoints leading in to the airport. Right. And, you know, the way that the Taliban does crowd control is is not in a way that is safe. Um, they're firing shots in the air. They're firing shots in the crowd, injuring people. Um, they are whipping people, beating them back and essentially not allowing people into the airport. It's different if you're a Westerner, you can get in. But if you're an Afghan right now trying to get into that airport, trying to get through those Taliban checkpoints, it is extremely difficult and extremely dangerous. So I should just say you're sitting there in the dark. We can see a, <laughs> we can see a slight <laughs> shadowy figure. Uh, I can just assure oh, people you are still there. Um, yes. So those scenes we saw, what were they, do you have any sense from having just been there, what were they hoping for, those people, as they were either clinging to the airplane or trying to get on? Were these ordinary Afghanis? Were they people who had already been promised passage in some way? Who were they? There are ordinary Afghans, mostly Afghans who've worked with the U.S. military or the U.S. Embassy or any number of the international organizations, the U.N., USAID. Um, and they believe they're under threat, and they also believe they're entitled to these SIDS, right? These these visas that would allow them to go to the U.S. I actually interviewed one man on the street today who had a green card. He had a green card, and still he couldn't get in uh, to the airport perimeter. And they're just desperate, Freddie. Honestly, there's no coherent uh, information coming out. It's like a game of telephone rumors spread, people panic. Mm. And so they turn up with a couple of cases with their families and they desperately try to get in. And the reality is that many of them don't have the paperwork that they need to, to get on one of those flights. Mm. But they're in a place where they feel like they have nothing to lose and no other options. And is there a bit more order there today? The sort of press releases read that the US has secured order in the airport. Is that true? I think once you enter Kaya, the, the Kabul airport sort of compound and on the military side, things are, are pretty orderly there and they're moving pretty well. But on the outside where I was today by those Taliban checkpoints, it's very chaotic, very dicey. Uh, we had a couple of close calls. Mm. Um, not a good situation at all. And let me ask you as a final question before I let you find some light. I, do you worry about I'm, your own exit? Our own exit. I mean, how, are you, I mean if there are these checkpoints, uh, how are you going to make yeah. sure you get out? Do you feel in, in any kind of fear? I think that as a Westerner, we have the advantage of, 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 of you know, trying to get through those Taliban checkpoints. The Taliban don't want Westerners to stay here. They want us out. So the, the, we are some of the very, very lucky few who can get through those checkpoints. It's still dangerous and difficult, as, as, many, um, as many people who've managed to evacuate have found. We're constantly reassessing the situation on the ground, constantly making sure that we have a feasible exit plan available to us. But honestly, right now, my primary concern is just reporting on the story at hand and the story of you know, what people here are going through. Clarissa Ward, thanks for taking the time and safe passage back when you do come home. Thank you. That was Clarissa Ward, the chief international correspondent at CNN. We could just about make her out there in the end. It was a dark room. There had been a power cut, but the screen of the computer was lighting her face. This is the life, of, I suppose, of a uh, foreign correspondent reporting on these kind of situations. But we were really just pleased to hear a little bit from her side of the story, what she's been seeing. We hear these online discussions about CNN being a uh, network that has political affiliations. People try and turn these things into culture wars. But I think what we should all be more interested in is what she's seeing on the ground in this place that is clearly going through a historic moment. So thanks to her and thanks for watching. This was Unheard.